It is Joshua chapter 2. If you've got a Bible there, I'd love for you to turn. We may not be the brightest or the wealthiest or the most clever, but with God we can do absolutely anything. And you and I, we typically look into the mirror and we see our failures or scars. We see our weakness, but God sees how amazing we can be as we act in faith with him. So today, and it's very early in Joshua, which in itself I think is refreshing, we have a story of a very unsuspecting character who literally affects the history of Israel, and then, as we'll see, also affects the line of Jesus also. There was this gal who had a dream that she received diamonds for her birthday, and she was pretty excited about that and woke up and said to her husband, I had this dream last night, and I got diamonds. What's the story? And he says, well, you're going to have to wait and see. And she goes, oh. So the next night, she had a dream that she had uh, a matching uh, necklace to go with the earrings. And now she's, like, really excited, and she wakes up and grabs and says, please, tell me what it means. And goes, nah, you're going to have to wait. And so the night before her birthday, she has yet another dream. And on that night, she dreamt of having pearls. And she woke up all excited. It's her birthday. She grabs her present, and the husband's smiling, and she opened it up, and sure enough, it's a book on how to interpret dreams. <laughs> now, we don't, we don't always get what we expect, and God doesn't always use who we expect. God's ways are above our ways, and he will have the most unsuspecting people do some of the most unexpected things in a strange time as well, times of which we go, there is no way out of anything. I don't know who God's going to use, but I know it won't be this person, and God smiles as it were and goes, that's awesome. You picked them. Like, really? Is that possible? Well, this is what we learn from the story of Rahab. She is the last person that we would expect God to use, but that's exactly what he did. Israel's future hung in the balance. And in comes this beautiful, wonderful woman who actually solves the problem for them and becomes an example for us on amazing faith. So let's think about stretching our own faith, not limiting ourselves, but putting our hands, ourselves in the hands of God and stretch ourselves to be used by him in remarkable ways. The text today, I've just pulled out three points on how we can stretch our faith. Take a look at the first verses of chapter 2 of Joshua. It was Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And then she said, True, the men came to me, but I don't know where they were from. And then the gate was about to be closed at dark, and the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them. Uh, let's see. But she had brought them to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that they laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. If you have this picture, Israel is still Transjordan. They're still on the east side of the Jordan. They're going, sending two spies just to look at everything, but right in front of them is Jericho. Jericho is sitting five miles west of the Jordan River. 
and it was its own kingdom. That's kind of how it was there. We think of boundaries, and it's not so much cities were their own kingdom. So it's the king of Jericho, and they had this boundary around them and this border, this wall, six miles north of the Dead Sea, only 15 miles from Jerusalem. And if you have been there, you can imagine it because they've excavated the actual foundations of that Jericho, known to be one of the oldest cities in the world. So there's the spot. And where do they go when they're told, go ahead and go spy out the land? These two guys went directly to the prostitute's house. Hmm. What in the world are they... It's genius. That was probably a bit of an inn, tavern, people come and go. You think of like the Old West, the saloon with the, quote, upstairs, right? That's what this was. So if you want to be not noticed, go there. Because there's people that people don't know coming and going there all the time. If you want to know what's going on in the city, go there. And then it didn't work. Because they were not there long when word went back that, yeah, there's some people here that are actually here to check this place out to see how they can destroy us. The unsuspecting part is right there in verse 4, but the woman had taken the two men and hid them. This is where it starts to break, the story, that this gal is risking everything. She's risking her Uh, her home, her family, herself, to actually go against the king of Jericho by hiding these guys. Everything she knew was now at risk. Well, the spies were completely now at their mercy. She said, here, go up top of the roof and we'll just throw thatch stuff on you and you'll be fine. They were in so much trouble that they did it. This could have been hilarious. The come, they come in saying, hey, we're the king looking for him. And she goes, yeah, they're up in the thatch. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't even have to be careful. They're stuck. There's only one way out of here. Just walk up and get them. That's how much at risk Israel and the spies were. It was over. If I'd been one of the two spies and it had been found out, I would have said, it's done. Send word to Joshua, find two more spies, because it's over. And out of nowhere, this gal turns and saves their lives. And I want to make a side point to that. God has people everywhere. God knows people everywhere. You don't. You're walking in somewhere to work or a place, and you're thinking, I don't know anyone, I'm in trouble. And God goes, oh, no, 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 I got people everywhere. You're good. Remember when Sarah and I, driving from Liberty University back home just for a short weekend, it's a 500-mile drive, and halfway there, my sweet ride, my Oldsmobile Cutlass, with dual quad posi-traction lock-up torque converter, the head gasket, probably don't understand that, the head gasket went out. It was one of those diesels that should never have been. And I'm in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and I show up at a dealership, and they're like, oh, yeah, we can't get to this for like four days. And I'm looking at Sarah, I'm like, "We're we're in trouble. I have no idea what to do. And I start explaining it like it would help. You know, we're from Liberty in Virginia, and we're needing to really to get home. And the manager of the dealership gets word, comes out, and he goes, really? You guys from Liberty? And I'm like, this could be good or bad. (laughs) Jerry Falwell used to always say, when you mention my name, pucker up or duck. (laughs) He goes, they love me or they hate me, so be careful using my name. And I'm like, yeah, kind of, Liberty-ish, yeah, sort of. The guy goes, oh, we've been supporting his ministry forever. And he looked around at the manager of the um, service department and says, those kids are out of here today. How How does that happen? Well, it's because God has people everywhere. 
God can take care of you anywhere. And if it doesn't happen that way, it's because God didn't want it to happen that way. And it's a beautiful story here how this unsuspecting person saves their lives. You take specific notice again, a prostitute, yet she was an instrument in the hand of God. Literally, Israel in the balance. Too many people think they can't be used of God because something's happened in their past. And I'll tell you, something that's horribly unfair is that ministries and churches have said that to them. Oh, because you've done this in your life, you can only serve in this way. Oh, you, oh really? That was a bad one. So you need to be over here and only do this. God doesn't do that. We can be used in ways that are unexpected. In fact, it was just this morning, as I was reading this through again, that I stopped and realized, and I don't know the full significance of this thought, but she didn't change first. She was right then a prostitute running her business when God used her tremendously. How many of us have said or thought of ourselves, God could use me once I, I need to change this first. It was absolutely right, and God was already working in her heart. So she was already caught on. She knew who these two guys were, and she knew what was going on, and she knew the, the whole city was going to go go under to them, so she understood what was happening as she was doing her business. And God's hand was on her. What a lesson on A, a lesson on me and you judging people. Is that not right? Oh, could God really use them? They've this. No, forget about they did that in the past. I'm talking they could be doing it right now. You go, no, that's not possible. It's possible. You and I limit God based on our perceived generous, loving conservatism and judgmentalism that we think, oh, God's going to work in this way with these types of people. And then all of a sudden we have this. It's her. Yeah, but she cleaned up her life and she was already in a Bible study. She was doing a Beth Moore Bible study. <laughs> when this, she hadn't completed it yet, but she was in like week four, which was the week on service. So she was starting to feel guilty. No, no Beth Moore. Isn't that encouraging? I just kind of felt better about that. I thought, yeah. You know what? The one that comes in and hurry up. Yes, good, of course. Be changing our lives and let's always make ourselves better and let's eliminate sin and let's, let's be more godly as, as we can. Let's do all of that. Absolutely, keep going. But it's not so that I can be used of God. That happens now. And you and I need to stretch ourselves to say, God, what do you want me to do today? I am currently a mess you're sitting there thinking, oh, I've got more things going on in my life, and half of them I'm ashamed of, the other half I should be ashamed of. I'm just going to wait till I get things figured out to be used of God. No, serve in children's ministry now. Just do it now. You want to see growth in your life? Serve God. You want to focus in and just try to fix everything? Watch how slow that goes. But be convicted and say, you know what, I'm going to join the chaplaincy training. Or I'm going to go ahead and jump into children's. I don't even care where. I'm just going to go in there somewhere. And then what do you do? You interact with other people who are serving and growing and struggling on the front line. And you build friendships and relationships. And all of a sudden, we see this growth in our lives. And say, wow, God really can use me even though I'm a mess. And I wonder if it's, no, I think it's God really uses you, maybe especially because you're a mess. So take a look at the next one. 
I love her words. I just, it's just the whole scene. The scene is fantastic. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, this is verse 8, now verse 9, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of all has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Then she goes on with the history. It's unbelievable what she's figured out. For we've all heard the Lord dried up the water at the Red Sea before you in Egypt. How many years was that? Do you remember? How many years prior would it be? Yeah, 40 years or so. What you did to the kings of the Amorites, the Amorites would be, uh, again, for those of you who have traveled there, the capital of uh, Jordan is Amman. That's the Amorites. So it's that city, also one of the oldest cities in the world. So that capital city is what they're talking about. And so that's on the east side of the Jordan. So that's some of the conquering before they actually crossed into the Jordan. And he says, oh, we've heard about that. Beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and all the earth beneath. This is fantastic. This is not a prophet. I'm going to tell you, if we pulled those words out and took the words of a great prophet and put them side by side and you had to match who said what, you wouldn't think Rahab. This is so profound of what she's saying as God is speaking through her because they're going down up in this thatched roof and I'm going to tell you, they're still nervous. We know that they've all been detoured out of the gate and they're going to head over towards the Jordan by the fords in the river. Well, you know that's only five miles. They're coming back. And we better hope when they come back they think that there was some evidence that these two crossed the Jordan and went back over to the Israelites. Because if there is no evidence of that, they're coming back in, and where do they go? You go back to where you started, to Rahab, and said, okay, where are they? So they're bedding down on the top of this thing, still a little nervous, and she comes up and speaks some of the most motivating, inspiring words. I know that the Lord has given this land to you and the great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Note, if you will, the I know that the Lord, all caps. This isn't I know that God or your God. It's all caps, L-O-R-D. That is the proper name for God when you see him in all caps like that. It's Yahweh. She's actually referring to his name. This lady, how in the world is she getting this all figured out? It's not, oh, and their God. That would have been it. I know how their God. It wasn't that. I know that the Lord has done all of this. I want you then to go to verse 24. So the end of the chapter, this is when they finally, they make a bit of a pact with her that, hey, if you don't tell anybody, then we're not going to kill you kind of a thing. It's kind of a nice friendly pact. And then they get out and they go back over to the Israelites with uh, Joshua. And then they report in verse 24. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands and all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Okay, if I'm Joshua, which by the way, if you have a young Joshua in mind, it's not. He's about 80 years old. So Joshua is standing there, and he hears that report from the two spies. Truly the Lord, Yahweh, has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. All right, thanks, guys. Did you see that yourself, or did somebody tell you that? And they go, "Uh uh-oh, we kind of, um, we kind of heard it. We were, okay, we were bunked up. 
we were bunked up in a roof, and this uh, city leader, uh, <laughs> very influ let's say she's popular, she came to us and she told us this. Okay, who, who exactly? Joshua, you're going to have to trust us on this one. Can you believe the significance of this? They are repeating back to Joshua the things that Rahab said. And are building then, therefore, keeps going, then Joshua, the confidence to the army that eventually leads, because they haven't crossed over yet and they have some things to do. The battle against Jericho doesn't happen to chapter 6. We're in chapter 2. But all of this confidence then to head over, you can't get into the land unless you get Jericho. After Jericho, you can relax a little bit because the next city's a little ways away. But you're not crossing over until you get Jericho. You've got to get that. And they are taking the words of the prostitute. This is just fantastic to me. Her words were so compelling and uplifting and brought confidence. Okay, see where I'm going? If you and I imagined the power of what we could do with our words. Yeah, but I'm not really much. I don't think my, the CEO of my company, or I don't think the person, I don't think they'd been encouraged by me. Oh, no, please don't say that. Right now, God can use you and your words to encourage. Just heard a story yesterday. It was a high school classroom, and the teacher messed something up, and she gave a sincere apology to the class. And they dismissed. It was no big deal. One student stuck around afterwards and went to the teacher and said, hey, just... As far as that incident, just so you know, none of us are bothered by it. We so accept your apology. It's fine. It's not a big deal. And we heard about that through the teacher telling another teacher the highlight of that class was that she got some confirmation from a student that she was okay. Isn't that awesome? Who would think that a student, one of 30 or whatever it is, could have? Because we do. You and I have the power, and it's this figure out to get this wellspring out from us to speak, to speak into somebody's life, to build up and encourage. And can you, as a student, and can you, as a teacher or as a mom that's working and figuring out how to keep your house in order, can you speak like a prophet? Oh, yes, you can. Because that timely word or that positive word isn't given much today because we think of ourselves, but to think of that one, that flustered waiter or waitress is figuring out how to keep all these tables and hasn't refilled your iced tea, it seems like, in 30 minutes. To be that one when they finally come back to say, hey, you're doing fine. They go, oh, somebody didn't show up today. That's no big deal. We're good. It's 10 minutes. It's fine. You're doing good. You imagine what that does to a waiter? For you and I to see that within us, and that's what Rahab had. And that was God, that God gave her that kind of power and strength. And look at the last one, and it's the blessing. We stretch our faith, and there is a blessing. You could just look at verse 14. After she went through her big, long, this is all that I've heard. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, and I know what's going on. And they said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you don't tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And there it is. There's blessing. When you and I decide, I'm going to stretch and I'm going to, no matter who I am today, but as I am exactly right now, that I'm going to use my words and my actions to build up, stretch myself, I'll be blessed. And was she blessed? You talk about being incorporated into the people of Israel. You'd look in Matthew at the genealogy. Actually, if you look at all the women mentioned in that genealogy, it, it just brings a breath to you. 
It's ironic. There's four mentioned. So set Ruth aside for a moment, but you have Tamar who pretended she was a prostitute. She's in the lineage of Jesus. You have Bathsheba, enough said, and you have Rahab in the line of Jesus. What? So with her vast amount of experience as a citizen of Jericho, she gets folded in, marries in, and becomes in the line of Jesus. You think Jesus is embarrassed about that? He's proud of that. Where else is Rahab mentioned? She made it to the infamous Hebrews chapter 11. It's the hall of faith. Who are the greatest people in God's faith? Who was it? What are the names? There they are listed, and Rahab's one of them. Is this fantastic? I'm going to tell you, no matter where you have been, no matter where you are currently, God can and will use you if you stretch out in faith, allow to be used. And I want to end with one thought. I I, I have to admit, I do this too often. I, I don't know if it's when I'm tired, but I just start counting verses and I start curious, adding things up, and just, I want to see balance in text. How much text was given to one thing and how much text to another. So you have the story of Jericho mentioned in chapter 2 and chapter 6. This is an easy one. You just look to see how many verses of each, and then you add them up, and it's 51 verses to Jericho. 51. But then... I went through and added the verses that deal specifically with Rahab. 28 of the 51. Over half of the verses on the story of Jericho are about Rahab. I mean, if if that isn't, when you and I see her in heaven, we just want to give her a big hug and listen to her story on how God stirred in her heart and how she acted in faith. She must be just a beautiful person. But not if we'd been there and saw her at the time. Because you and I, many of us, would have been so judgmental. But God looks and sees something totally different. This is how much God loves you. No matter what you have done, and I just, again, I think the great point is not only just what God has or what you have done, what you are doing, what you're in the middle of right now. I'm not justifying the behavior or the attitude or the thought process. I'm not justifying any of it, but I'm saying it is very, very small of us in our view of God, to think that we have to clean ourselves up before he can use us. God is far bigger than that. And if that were the case, I will never be clean enough. Ever. I will never be clean enough. I mean, what is clean enough to be used in God's hand? Perfection, okay? Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, God views me perfect. But what if there's unconfessed sin? Does that somehow limit? It doesn't. If you and I would think, kind of broaden our minds and say, what can I do today to be used of God with my words? How could I build up and encourage with words? What can I do to lift up and be that prophet in somebody's life? What can I do with my volunteerism and my actions that I can actually participate and do something? Had a guy not long ago say to me, right here, this building, he goes, I would love to work with youth. I'd love to be involved in something, but I'm such a mess right now. And I'm like, well, so am I. So am I. Come on, let's go. Let's serve. Let's be used of God. And that's my challenge. And that's my encouragement to you today, is God loves you very much exactly where you are right now, and God can use you 
in wonderful ways with your speech and your actions, even right now. It's not something for the future. It's for today. Do you believe that?